Welcome to our service today. We so appreciate the fact that you have joined us. The scripture says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us rejoice today, regardless of what is going on in our lives. Let us appreciate God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ for what they have done in that what they have done for you and for me can never be undone. He, they have, God has saved you through the blood of His Son, and that will never be negated. Thank you so very much again, those of you from around the world. We appreciate you. So I bless you in the name of Jesus. I pray that God's best be yours. I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide you into all truth, and that you would always enjoy the fruitfulness of God and this amazing, undying, unending relationship. So may the Lord bless us as we stand here and all around the city, all around our internet audience. Let us worship Jesus. Brother James. Oh, Jesus, Lord, Father God, we thank you for today, Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for giving a voice to be able to praise you this morning, God, to giving us hands to be able to clap, Father God, and applause to your greatness for giving us feet to be able to dance into your presence, Lord. Father God, thank you for giving us lungs to be able to praise you with everything we have this morning, God. Thank you, Father God, that we can give you everything in our hearts and lay it down this morning, Lord. Father God, you're the king of majesty today. You're the king of majesty forever. Can we give him a shout of praise around the room? Come on up. Come on, give him praise around the room this morning. Come on, give him praise around the room. Here we go. Come on, put your hands together. Hear everybody singing with everything you have, Majesty. Majesty.
Somebody give him a shout of praise this morning. Father God, you are the king of majesty, Lord. Your word says in Psalms 146, Father God, that you reign, Lord. You reign forever. You reign upon this earth. You reign upon the skies. You reign upon the whole universe. It's all in your hands, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you, Lord, paint the skies, Father God. You call a new day every day, Lord. Your mercies are new every morning, God. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. Come on in. Here we go. Yeah, put your hands together now. You paint the night. Everybody sing. You paint the night. You count the stars and you call them by name. The sky.
Father, Father, thank you that we are, we are here because you called us to be here. We are here because you have done for us what we could not do for ourselves. You've rescued us from our failings. You've rescued us from our sin, our shame, and you've brought us into the very presence of God. We thank you for for this earth program removing from us what is unacceptable in your sight thank you yes you do change everything because all of our chains are falling they're not all gone yet but they are falling we thank you for it we ask that you would minister your life to us in various ways. We need you. We just need you. You are everything to us. I ask you to bless everyone who is assembled here, that you would cause them to know in a tangible way they are blessed and that nothing the enemy plans against them can succeed. You are in control of everything, not only the here and now, the present, but the future and the past is yours. You can nullify the effects of our past so that they do not pursue us right now 
and destroy what you are planning for us today. We thank you and we praise you. I pray that you would bless our children and our children's children, even our great grands, that you would do great things for them, that they would know that they have been given an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in you. They would know that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, through Jesus. We pray not only for these who are here, but these who are in Corpus Christi in the coastal bend. We pray for those who are across the world, Asia and Africa, Europe, further here in North America, and South America, Central America, Australia, and the islands of the sea. We pray for all of them. Have mercy upon us through Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I pray that, that you would bless the Cortez family. Just help them, strengthen them, take them through the hour of their pain and sorrow. Take them through this hour in the death of their son. We ask you to do this, God, in a way that that they will know that something supernatural has happened. We pray further, not only for the Cortez family, but for the, the Williams family and the great houses. We ask that you would strengthen Victor and Sandra in the death of their son. And we pray that death would not invade our ranks in some unauthorized manner. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, we pray for Pastor Bird and ask you to continue his recovery. We pray for th their daughter Christiana that you would continue to heal her and also Miranda in Jesus name. Continue to heal them from the car accident. We also pray Lord that you would so heal Dr. Bennett our sister that you would so heal her that this thing that came against her would not succeed today nor ever in Jesus name in Jesus name we pray for Pat and the healing of pancreatic cancer although it's it's supposed to be a death knell but with you that's not correct because you are in charge of life you're the living God. We want you to heal Pat, but not only Pat, but we pray for the healing and the complete strength of Luis and Charles, that they would be strong and that they would live a long and fruitful life because you're no respecter of persons. You've done it for others. You will do it for them. You will do it for them. You will do it for them. You did it for Fawn. You will do it for them and for Susan and for Nolan, the same for Susan and for Nolan and that Richard would be strengthened in Jesus name. We pray for Enem that she would be, be strong and mend well in Jesus name. Now Lord God we pray against this COVID-19 virus. We pray against it in Jesus name. We ask you Lord God that you would would heal Vanessa, Brian, Stephanie, that Rene and Anna heal Micheline and Sophia and Mark, Dwight and Miss J, Robert, Jessica, Gabby, heal them all. And those that we don't know about who are aff affiliated with us, heal them as well. And all those who have this COVID virus, we just ask, Lord, that you would do the work, that you would do the work in healing and ridding us of this thing. Bless our nation. Heal our nation from all of our divisions. Cause the church to be the church. And cause the church not to be a part of the division 
Cause us to be the glorious church you died for. Through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen. Amen. The revealed Christ. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. We need a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is certainly an emphatic statement, one that emphasizes our need for someone who is greater than we are. Without an understanding of him, we will never know who we are. The apostle Peter says to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In response, Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter. What an amazing response Jesus gives to Peter upon his recognition of who the Savior is. Knowing Jesus always gives us divine perspective. The Father's perspective becomes ours. Let us look at this revelation again. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You are Peter. Christ is light. And knowing him brings that light into our heart. When we receive this light, we begin knowing Jesus Christ. That is Jesus, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That is overwhelmingly good. It is so astonishingly wonderful that God could love us so much because he is God. It is not a matter of would love us, but could love us. God is love. It is not something that he only does, but it is a matter of who he is. Principles are wonderful and the rules of life are great especially those methods and steps that work. But Jesus himself is and should be our only emphasis and purpose. He must be revealed to us and in us. In Galatians 1, 15 through 16, Paul says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. When Christ is revealed, lives are changed forever. Father, reveal your son to us and then in us. Pastor Don.
Well, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for what you have done thus far. We thank you. We pray that our being with you today is not just routine. We pray that we've come here to hear from you. We've come to worship you, to hear from you, to do whatever you want. So we thank you so very much. We want our hearts to be holy ground. We want to be a place of sanctuary. We give you the glory and the honor for it. Thank you so much, Jesus. Amen. 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 Wow, thank you so much for, for your presence here today. And I want to thank our internet audience for being here. We, we have so many of you brothers and sisters who are from Asia who are uh, sharing with us on a regular basis. We want to thank you uh, from Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, and other places there in Asia. Also in Africa, those of you who are, who are in Zimbabwe on the east, southeast there, and uh, Kenya, over the, and also on the west, we want to thank you for uh, tuning in from Ghana, Togo, Benin, and even at times Zambia. We thank you so much for that. And, and across Europe, uh, Croatia, and uh, Serbia, we want to thank you for Belarus and, uh, and for Albania. Amen. And India is showing up today. Hey, wow, India. Now, you know I love you. And so uh, if you're showing up from India, you keep showing up. And then one day we want you to show up right here in the, on this pulpit. All right? Well, we bless you. We bless you so much. Thank you so very, very much. I want to uh, welcome our first-time guest today. Um, if you're a first-time guest, we don't want to say a visitor, but just a first-time guest to us. Would you mind uh, raising a hand that we might see you, recognize you? Anybody a first-time guest? Oh, wow. Thank you, ma'am. I waved at you twice coming in. Well, coming in and one going out. I'm so glad that you came. Uh, I didn't know you were first-time guest because I couldn't see behind the mask. Yes. Thank you so much. You know, when I go out into, into uh, uh, the city and I have on my mask, people always say, hello, pastor. I thought I could not rob anything. <laughs> yeah. Hello, pastor. Well, super. Well, listen, let's say hello to our guest. We'll wave at her, and then we'll stand up and wave at each other. Give a meaningful wave, not a perfunctory, you know, not that perfunctory thing. Give a good wave. Yeah. Bless the Lord. Bless you. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. And somebody wave at Sister Deborah. It's, it, yeah, she's been gone for so long. Wave at her. Throw some love over there. <laughs> wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, ask you if you would stay after service today. We're going to uh, uh, announce uh, something after service. We want you to stay uh, just a few minutes, maybe about five minutes, no, ma no more, no more than that. Also, I would like to announce a symposium. Um, are we going to do a promo now? Okay, let me, uh, right before I do that, we want you to register. The, the symposium is February 18 through 21. And also, um, we want you to register now. It's free. You don't have to pay anything except a little energy to go on the Internet and do it. All right? Uh, T-shirts, uh, this last day to order, um, last Saturday. Oh, this Saturday. Oh, last day to order. It's not last Saturday. It's last day to order. All right? And so, and also we want you to come, come uh, out here or watch online the symposium uh, February the 18th uh, through the 21st. We don't want you to just say, oh, that's something the church is doing. We want you to participate and be a part of that. All right? And you may go to our website, uh, tfisymposium2021.com, and you can register there and uh, just find out what we're going to do. Now, we'll, we'll look at the uh, promo video. saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. <laughs> wow. Well, that, that was good, wasn't it? Uh, we want to thank uh, our sister Susan Liberto and also Pastor Tim for that. I think Pastor Tim is somewhere here. But uh, we want to thank him for that. It's, this really good work, isn't it? Wow, I, I think it's really good work. Aaron Grazia. Are you here, Aaron? Oh, he's on the camera, Aaron. We can't forget you, but I forgot you. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you, Aaron. <laughs> so, okay, so it's time to give. It's time to give. So here in the fellowship, we have three ways to give. And uh, you can give here by cash, check, or envelope. So if you need an envelope, raise your hand, please. And uh, we also can give online. You go to our website, cccfellowship.com forward slash give, and then follow those instructions. If, if you're a millennial, you, you probably prefer to give by text. And you can text 361-386-2565. That is 361-386-2565. And uh, type in the word keywords and then for giving options. Are we good? All right, and I would like to bless the offering, and then the next voice you're going to hear is that from uh, Reverend Stan Mack, who is going to be bringing us the word this morning uh, in this first service, all right? Father, we are grateful to you for, for yourself, for who you are, and for your finished work through Jesus Christ that can never be nullified, can never be made void, can never be undone or changed. But we are so amazed with you. We thank you for just you. We thank you for your son who is not just our Savior, but he is our life. He is our life, our, our Savior, our life. We want to thank you for him, for Jesus. And we pray that everything that is done here today would be done to glorify Jesus. And in glorifying Jesus, you are glorified. Thank you, Father, for that. Bless these givers here. I pray that nothing will come in the way of them and you. Nothing will come between you. I pray that all that they touch will be blessed and prosper. I pray that the word of God will prosper in their mouths and whatever you place in their hands uh, would uh, be increased. I thank you for their health, spiritually and physically, that you would heal their bodies and keep their bodies strong, making them whole, I pray, through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Good morning. Wonderful. Good job, Chris. I'm telling you, you're about as consistent as it comes. Well, uh, it is my pleasure to be here this morning. More than you know. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, after I dropped my wife off in the front of the church, after I parked, I tripped on the way in here and almost fell. Yeah. And uh, I'm 71 years old, so falling changes when you get old. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's not like when you're young, you know, and you... you <laughs> Hey, yeah, when you're young, the only consideration is, did anybody see me? You know, it's like you, 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 you just bounce right up and brush yourself off and check to make sure nobody saw you and then go on and pretend like it never happened. When you get old, you pray to God somebody saw you. <laughs> but you're going to need some help getting back up. So, man, I, I was thinking, boy, a disaster was averted. Because, man, that would have been, I can't imagine coming in here with my, my pants all scratched up and everything. And I thought, oh, my goodness, thank you, Lord. The goodness of God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, amen. Yeah, he's worthy to be praised. So give him a hand clap on that. Yes, help me get up. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's just not what it used to be. Um. Pastor Don has been telling us uh, pretty consistently that during his time, this is really more about the church than it is about the world. And uh, we've all understood that to some extent, and uh, we've all tried to walk in that, knowing that it is really about us and our response to what's going on in the world. But the only way we can see that clearly is when we see God's end for us, God's purpose. The title of this message is God's Eternal Purpose. Because we need to see what God's end is. Otherwise, it becomes difficult to understand why we have to go through these things. Why they come upon us. We need to know what is God's eternal purpose. What is he after? Why did he create all of this? Why is it necessary if it's all about us that we go through it like the rest of the world? What is that about? And it's kind of hard to understand if you are thinking that it has to go according to your own understanding. But this is according to God's understanding. And so we need to understand and know what his purpose is. His eternal purpose, the unchanging purpose, what that is. So turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 10. And let's look at God's eternal purpose. I want to make sure that my iPad doesn't turn off on me. So I've got to extend the time. But chapter 1, verse 10. This is Paul speaking of the eternal purpose. Let's look at verse 9 and read 9 and 10 together. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. 
to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. I don't like that version. That's NIV. Well, I do like NIV, but I don't like that verse in that version. So let's read it in New King James. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. That's God's eternal purpose. It's what everything that we go through and have to deal with is for. It is to accomplish that purpose because we will fulfill what God has purposed. It cannot be thwarted. When he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times you might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, he's saying the same thing that he said in Romans 8.29 when he said that Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren. The same thing he said in Colossians when he said that in all things he might have preeminence. And again in Colossians when he said that Christ might be all and in all. So the thing we have to understand here is that God's eternal purpose is our conformity to Christ because he purposed to have a family. And we've been made a part of that family. And so God is in the process of transforming us into the image of his son. So when we see that, another question comes to mind, and it is, if that's the case, then why the free will of man? Why did God jeopardize all of that by giving man the ability to disobey, to choose his own will apart from God's will? Why would God put this whole program in jeopardy? It sounds like it's one of those questions that we would have to um, see into the mind of God at every different at every given moment to understand, but it's not. God has made known His will right here in the scriptures, and the thing that has to be uppermost in our understanding is this. God's will is sovereign. And that God's eternal purpose cannot be thwarted. Because before he created anything, God had already finished everything. Let me say that again. Before he created anything, God had already finished everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now that may be a little difficult to understand, but this chapter, explains it very well. This whole chapter from verse 4 to verse 14, well, there's a prayer at the end, and excluding the prayer, his introduction and the benediction in chapter, in verse 3, from verse 4 to verse 14 is about the eternal purpose of God. That's what this whole section is about. Now, in order to understand why God's purpose cannot be thwarted, we need to look at two things. First off, we need to see the three phases of God's plan of redemption. You see, redemption didn't come by just one thing. It came in three different phases. And then secondly, 
We need to see the Father's initiative before creation. What God did before he started to create anything. So let's look at those two things in this chapter and see if we can grasp that. The three phases of God's plan of redemption. Let's look first at this. These three phases are easy to delineate because there's a phrase that comes at the end of each of those phases. In verse 9 and 10, we read, Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Now, this may not seem like a big deal until you look at verse 12. And in verse 12, if I can make my thing work right, my, forget that. In verse 12, Paul talks about the glory of God. And he talks about it in verse 6. He talks about it in verse 12. And he talks about it again in verse 14. In verse 12, he says, um, I don't want to use that anymore. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In verse 14, he says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And then if you go back to verse 6. It's a little bit convoluted here. But it's, he says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. The exact same phrase that's in verse 12 and verse 14 is there in verse 6. But two words have been added, of grace. So if we read this literally in the Greek, it would be to the praise of of his glory of grace. That's a bit difficult. So the translators rearranged it so that it makes sense to the praise of the glory of his grace. But quite frankly, the same statement is there in verse 6 that's in verse 12 and is in verse 14 because it separates these three phases. From verse 4 to verse uh, 6, it shows the Father's initiative. From verse 7 to verse 12, it's showing the work of the Son. And from verse 13 and 14, it shows the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In other words, redemption occurred this way. The Father's initiative before time began. Then when the fullness of time had come, the Son's work. And when the son finished his work, then the ministry of the Holy Spirit began. Okay? That's how our redemption took place. In the father's um, initiative, it's talking about what God did before anything else. Okay? And it is showing us, as Paul is, how we should be in praise for election, adoption, and acceptance. In the work of the Son, he shows us how we should be in praise for redemption and forgiveness. Verse 9 and 10, he shows us praise for the mystery of his will. And in verse 11, praise for our inheritance. Verse 13 and 14, he's showing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he's showing us praise for being sealed in verse 13 and in verse 14. Praise for being guaranteed until redemption. Man, I love that. Guaranteed until redemption. You see, our redemption, we think it started with Jesus Christ. It did not. It started with God the Father before creation. And the Father put
put some things in place before he began creating. Now, I know that's a little difficult to understand, but what you have to realize is this. Nothing that happens today catches God by surprise because he already planned it all. He planned every part of it. He planned everything from the beginning, before creation. And then when the sun came, the sun was part of that plan. And when the sun finished his work, the Holy Spirit began his ministry as part of that plan. So both the so all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Godhead were involved in man's redemption. And the eternal purpose was that Christ would be the firstborn of many brethren, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he would be all and in all. Okay? So that's why we have to go through all these things. Second, let's look at the Father's initiative before creation because this is what helps us to understand why God's sovereign will cannot be thwarted. It helps us to understand what it means that before he created anything, God had already finished everything. You see, in verse 4, there's a key word, chosen. In verse 5, there's a key word, predestined. In verse 6, there's a key word, accepted. And those three key words help us to understand what God did before he even began creating. You see, in verse 4, it helps us to understand that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's hard for us to truly grasp. Tell you what, go with me over to the book of 2 Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 9. And this verse says, Who has saved us, meaning God, and called us, with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. See, that's why your salvation is guaranteed until the day of redemption. Because grace was given to you before you ever got here. God loved you and chose you among the billions that would come upon the face of the earth. And grace was given to you in advance. So that when you arrived, you would arrive just like any other fallen son of Adam. Not knowing that you really belonged to him. Yes. You see, God loved you and knew you before you got saved. Yeah. And God's purpose in all of this was that you would stand holy and blameless before him. Think about that. Holy and blameless before him. Now, here's what you have to know. This is the Lord's doing. Left to ourselves, no way we can accomplish this. But God has purposed it, and he will accomplish it. That means it's not an if, and, and, but. You will stand holy and blameless before God. Because everything about you and in you that is not of God will no longer be there. But not only uh, will we stand holy and without blame before him. I know this verse in uh, verse 4, it, it says, holy, holy and without blame before him in love. Now, you've got to understand that 
at the time these scriptures were written, punctuation as we know it did not exist. So the punctuation here is always a variable, meaning that it's not hard and fast. It's pretty accurate most of the time. In this case, I don't think so. Because I think in love, that little prepositional phrase, I think it modifies the following clause, not the preceding. Because when I read it, I read it in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons. And what that means is God's love was upon you because of the grace that had been given to you before time began. And because he loved you, he predestined you to adoption as son. Now, when we look at predestined, I know that's a word that causes a problem with some because they always think, well, predestination means that God predestined some to be saved and he predestined some to be lost. That's not accurate. This word is used six times in the New Testament and not once is it applied to the loss. This word is always connected, as Paul uses it, is always connected to the elect. And God's foreknowledge of the elect. You see, in Romans 29, when it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestined. You see the connection? That's the type of implicit connection. Now, it's explicit there, but it's implicit all through where Paul uses this word, meaning that predestination has nothing to do with the rest of the world. Everybody else in the world is just free to make their own choices and go their own way and work their own will. Everybody, like Isaiah said, is, you know, is just <laughs> doing their own will, having their own way. They're just turning to their own way. Because they're free to do that. Yes. Now, can this interfere with the will of God? Of course it can. Can it hinder the will of God? Not in the least. Because of what God did before he started creating. In verse 6, it says that we are accepted. The key word there is accepted. And accepted is not, well, the truth is, Paul coined this word because he took grace, which is a noun, and converted it to a verb. He verbalized it. And he verbalized it for the purpose of a play on words. Read it this way in verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. When you realize that Paul verbalized grace, and if we use it the same way we use our, um, our verb to grace, that phrase, then the best word would be be graced. So Paul created a play on words when he says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he be graced us in the beloved. But the idea is accurate. Accepted is the right word. The King James translators, they caught the idea. And that's the word that really, I believe, most appropriately conveys that. You see, when we understand that before he created anything, God had already finished everything, we are understanding that God prepared for all the exigencies that would take place in creation. Let me give you a, a picture of it. When a great building is about to be built, before one nail is hammered, before any cement is poured, before any studs go in place, before any of these things happen, something else has to take place. blueprint, a plan. You see, 
before the contractor does one single thing, the architect must finish. And when the architect is designing, he builds into his plan alternate materials if necessary. They don't change the construction of the building. They just make an allowance for it. If this is no longer available, then use these and place them here. They make an allowance for the things that he may run into that can't be accounted for. You see, that contractor doesn't start until that blueprint is finished. God is both the architect and the contractor. He's both the designer and the builder. And he built into the design allowances for the free will of man. They don't alter his eternal purpose. They just make room for the little things that are contrary to his will. Being both the builder, the architect, and the contractor, the designer, and the builder means that God, before he ever did anything, had already finished everything. Like the architect and the contractor, God being both created everything only after he had finished everything. That means before he created anything, God had already finished everything. His eternal purpose can never be thwarted. Because he has already decided in himself before he did anything that his purpose would stand and stand it does. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful to you for your obedience to the Father. For the example that you gave us. For making us to know that you are the pattern before us that will be fulfilled in us. Thank you, Father, for the great kindness that was exhibited toward us before we even had sense enough to know that you loved us. And we glorify the Holy Spirit of God who is the executor of the eternal purpose moving daily to assure that all that God has purpose will come to pass. Thank you so much, oh God, for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
good day, isn't it? Uh, let me read something before we receive communion today. Uh, I want to say to Brother Stan how much I appreciated the word. Uh, I really appreciated the word very much. I was thinking, I was thinking, now this is the time when we need to sit on, on the stage here and talk about it. That's what I was thinking because what came to my mind was what Peter says, the Apostle Peter said concerning Paul, he said, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As, all, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them, in these things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. I was thinking as he shared, I thought, mm, how many of us really truly grasp this amazing work that God has done? Do we really know that no matter how we teach it, sometimes our preconceived ideas and notions have more to do with our understanding than our studies. Because when you have thoughts in your head, sometimes they will preclude other things that you should know. That's just with all of us. It's not like you're different than anybody else. So we have to work on that and allow the Holy Spirit to, to move in us in that manner. I was so blessed and I wanted to share that with you because I thought we need to, maybe someday soon we'll just sit down and talk about it. And then you can ask questions and we can even further explain and elaborate on it. God has done something for us that cannot be undone. Cannot be undone. There's no way. There's no way in the world that, that you're going to fail in reaching your goal because God has an interest in you. You are his inheritance too. And, that, and so I was just so blessed. I want to thank you again for that message. And in light of that, I want us to, to now receive communion. It's sort of like bringing everything together. We have heard about what the Father had planned. And when you think about what the Father had planned for you, this is amazing. Every good parent has plans for the children. Yeah. And so he has great plans for you. And, and, and he has worked it all out worked it all out for you and he says boy I've got plans for them that they've, they've never dreamed of they, they, it could not even enter into their heart but I'm going to give them the Holy Spirit so he will give them an inkling of it yeah this is what he has done for us and, and wow I, I can't, just can't wait to have the fullness of that inheritance amen amen Therefore, we're going to now receive this communion because what we're showing here is that Jesus did everything well. His, the salvation that he offered, the blood that he shed, the life, the food that he gave us, it's all summed up in this little sacrament that we have. I'm going to call it a sacrament. This is not a ritual. This is something greater. That we take this bread, this wafer, and we eat it to show the heavenlies. All angelic beings out there. There are multitudes of multitudes. And we're showing them that the redeemed company lives because of that one man. Jesus Christ. We're showing them that He is our bread. We were fallen creatures, fallen. But He gave Himself for us. And now we live because of Him. 
And not only do we live biologically, but we live spiritually. We live eternally. You are, even in your present e earthly suit, you are eternal. And this is what we're showing, and we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're saved by the life of Jesus. So let us eat this bread. Small but very significant. I always like to remind us that Jesus was talking about this one day in the Galilee area, Capernaum, and he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Now, every good Jewish person should have known that he was speaking of the Passover. Every one of them should have known that. But sometimes you can get so messed up, you stop knowing what you ought to know. Yeah, there are things that you and I have learned that are true, and we allow untruth to take them out of our minds and out of our hearts. So obviously they had done that because he said, you have to eat the flesh of the Son of Man, or you have no life in you, and you have to drink his blood. What? Those guys were stuck on not the truth of, of, of the Scriptures, but just the, the letter, the word. They were just going through it. They go, this is a hard saying. Who can accept this? They left Jesus and they didn't walk with him anymore. But Jesus said these words. The words that I speak to you, they are a spirit and they are life. And we know that we, without the applying of the blood, there's no remission of sin. Without the applying of the blood, you die an eternal death. But with the blood applied, when you fully receive it, you will live forever. And this is what Jesus has promised. This is what he has guaranteed, he said. He guaranteed it. He made it ours. This is yours. This is your inheritance. And let us drink as we teach the universe. Um, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wow, thank you, Lord Jesus. You, you may remain standing if you would like, or... <laughs> yes, or you can keep your particular posture. But we're going to be leaving today, and I'm just grateful that we had a little time to internalize the message today. Let us internalize these messages when they're, they're taught we are living in what Paul described as the evil day. Do you agree with that? I trust that you agree with that. We're living in the evil day, and there are all forms of, of trickery and deception, all kinds of schemes. And the devil's not trying to get who he's got. You know that. He's trying to get those he doesn't have. But we heard a secret today. It's no longer a secret. He can't get those who God has. Amen. Amen. Wow. Wow. Let's, let's leave out of here on, on, on a cloud. Huh? Let us, we're going to bless you now. And we'll lift up our hands and we'll bless each other by saying, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And the Lord give you his peace. In Jesus' name, I bless you.